This lecture is part of an online algebraic geometry course about schemes and will be about quasi-coherent um, sheaves. Um, the choice of the word quasi-coherent is particularly unfortunate because these are the most basic sorts of modules over um, or modules of sheaves of modules over a scheme and unfortunately we landed with this five syllable monstrosity as a name for them. Um, this is for complicated historical reasons. Coherent sheaves originally appeared in the study of complex analytic manifolds and quasi-coherent sheaves were a sort of variation of them which turns out to be the really basic sort of sheaf. But anyway, we're stuck with this word, so we have to make the best of it. So I suppose X is a ringed space with um, a sheaf of rings OX. Um, now, the idea is that sheaves over a space behave like sets. They're, they're a sort of weak model of set theory. And a sheaf of rings should be thought of as a ring in this funny model of set theory. And over a ring, you should consider the modules over it. So we should consider modules over this ring on the ring space. And um, a sheaf of OX modules is defined in what is essentially the obvious way. Um, we have a sheaf um, F such that F of U is a module over um, um, o of u, uh, where u is open um, in x, and these all have to be compatible with restriction homomorphisms. So if v is contained in u, we have matched from o u to o v, and we have matched from f of u to f of v, and let's call both of these restriction maps rho. And then if we've got an element r in here and an element f in here, so um, f is an element of this module, then rho of r f should be equal to rho of r times rho of f. In other words, the action of this ring on this module should be compatible with restriction homomorphisms in the obvious way. And a morphism of modules is again defined in the obvious way. If we've got two sheaves of modules F and G, then a morphism of sheaves of modules from F to G would just be a morphism of sheaves from F to G, such that um, F of U mapping to G of U is a morphism of modules. Um, and modules over a sheaf of rings behave much like modules over a ring. You can do many of the standard operations. You can take kernels and images and direct sums and define exact sequences. Um, the, 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 the precise way of stating this is to say that the, the sheaves of modules over a, a sheaf of rings form an abelian category. And abelian category can be defined informally as a category that sort of looks very much like the category of abelian groups. Um, so let's look at some examples. Um, here we're going to, let, let's just take R to be a ring and let's take X to be the, the spectrum of R um, points prime ideals. And what we're going to do is suppose we've got a module um, M over R, what we're going to do is to form a sheaf of modules over um, the spectrum of, of R. And M twiddle is defined like this. So um, you remember spectrum of R has all these open affine sets D, F for F in R which can be sort of informally as the um, set of points where F doesn't vanish or more precisely where F isn't contained in the prime ideal. So what we have to do is 
we just have to define what the sheaf is on each of these open sets. And we just set m twiddle at this open set is just m f to the minus one. So this is a module over um, r f to the minus one. And as I said earlier, in order to define a sheaf, you only need to define it on, on this nice basis of open sets. So, so this, this is good enough to define it. And we can check this forms a sheaf Well, this is similar to the proof that, um, um, similar to the proof that defining um, the, the value on D of F to be this forms a sheaf. Um, so, uh, for example, If we take R to be the integers, let's take the easiest non-trivial example, and we might take M to be Z over 2Z, then we get a sheaf. So if you draw a picture of spectrum of Z, you remember it has a generic point zero and it's got all these primes, two, three, and so on. Then the stalk of the corresponding sheaf will be Z modulo 2Z at this point here and it'd be zero at all these other points and it's zero even at the generic point. So this is for z modulo 2z. On the other hand, if you take and to be say the integers, you can check that the, 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 the stalk at the point zero is, is now q and the stalk at the local, at, at the point two will be just equal to the local ring z2 and so on. So um, you can turn any module into a sheaf. And next we can ask, are our modules the same as module um, sheaves of modules over um, OX, where, where X is the spectrum of R? And um, it's easy to check that if M and N are modules, then HOM of M to N is essentially the same as the homomorphism from M twiddle to N twiddle. So um, what we're really asking when we ask are all modules the same as sheaves of modules, are we, we're asking are they equivalent categories? And the morphisms in both turn out to be the same. However, there's a bit of a problem. Um, the problem is that um, the spectrum of R has um, modules that do not come from modules over the ring R. So there are too many um, sheaves of modules over the sheaf of rings of spectrum of R. So let's see an example of this. Let's take R to be um, just um, Z localized at two, which is the rational numbers M over N with N odd. So this is a discrete valuation ring and its spectrum looks like this. It's got <coughs> Uh, a, a generic point corresponding to the ideal naught and a closed point corresponding to the ideal two. And let's think what about a module over, uh, a sheaf of module over spectrum of R is. Well, um, you have to provide a, a module over this open set and a module over the open set of that minus a point. So it consists of a pair of modules M mapping to N, where um, this is a module over R, and this is a module over over Q. So um, 
um, where, where, where Q is the ring of functions associated with the open set where you remove this. So if you unwind the definition of a, of a sheaf of modules, it turns out to be equivalent to this. You need to give a pair of modules and a homomorphism between them um, compatible with, with the um, embedding of R into Q. Um, however, um, if M comes, if, if you take the sheaf of modules coming from an R module M um, for um, M hat, N would have to be M inverted at a half. So um, the modules coming from the, sorry, the sheaves of modules coming from modules over a ring are very special. Um, and instead of having, instead of being allowed to choose an arbitrary um, module over the rationals here, it would have to be of this special form. For example, we can now take M to be Z2 and N to be zero. And this would be a sheaf of modules not coming from a module over R. So this is a real problem because we want modules over the spectrum to be the same as modules over the rings. So how do we fix this? Well, um, we say a, a module, an OX module is called quasi-coherent. There's that long word again. Um, if it is locally of the form M twiddle. Well, what does that mean? Um, so that means it locally looks as if it's a, a module over a ring in some sense. Well, there are two possible ways we could um, define this. We could say um, this means X is covered by affine opens UI so that M on UI is of the form um, MI twiddle, where MI is um, module over RI and UI is the spectrum of RI. So this is saying we can cover it by open affine such that M looks like um, a module over a ring. Alternatively, we could say for all open affines U in X, we have um, um, M on U is of the form, um, sorry, I shouldn't be calling that M, I should be calling this F. So that F, F on U is of the form M twiddle, where um, M is a module over R, and U is the spectrum of R. So there are two different possibilities. Um, so this one has the advantage that it's a local definition. So a module M satisfies this condition if it satisfies it locally everywhere. This one has the advantage that it gives the right answer for the spectrum of a ring R. It means that if you've got a, a, a ring R, then the modules over the spectrum of R are, are essentially the same as the modules over R. Fortunately, these two conditions are equivalent. So we don't have to worry about which of them is the most important. Um, so I'll sketch the proof that they are equivalent. Um, I'm going to miss out a certain amount of bookkeeping and we reduce to the key case, which says, suppose R is a ring. And suppose spec of R covered by um, and some open affines of the form DFI for FI and R, where as usual, this means roughly the points where FI doesn't vanish. 
Um, since the spectrum of R is compact, we can assume there are a finite number of these. And saying it's covered by open affines means the ideal generated by F1, F2, and so on is just R. Um, and now, suppose um, F is an OX module here where X is the spectrum of R. Um, um, and suppose F restricts to a quasi-coherent module on each OFI, then F is quasi-coherent. So this is sort of saying that um, for affine opens, if something is locally quasi-coherent, then it's coherent. Um, here, I guess I should decide which notion of quasi-coherence we're using. Here we're going to use the um, um, definition of quasi-coherence that um, every open affine um, subset has, has, uh, um, has, has the nice property. Um, so what we've got to do um, is um, show that the following map is an isomorphism. So let, let's just draw a picture to focus our attention. So let's take a set DF1 and DF2 and df3. So I'm going to cover our the spectrum of the ring by three open affine sets, which will be enough to illustrate all the complications. And we've got a module homomorphism from m to f of df1. Here, um, m is f of x, so it's a set of global sections of, of f, and we're restricting it to df1. Um, so this is just the restriction homomorphism. Now this induces a map from mf1 minus 1 to fdf1. And what we want to do is to, we want to show that this is an isomorphism. And if we show that for all i, then it will be easy to show that, that um, the, the, the module f is quasi-coherent in whichever sense you want. So, so proving that this is an isomorphism is the key technical step of the proof. All the rest is kind of routine bookkeeping. Um, so um, we do this in first two steps. We want to show it is injective. And we want to show it as surjective. Um, so let's first show that m f one minus one maps to f d f one is injective. Um, well, suppose m in m has image naught. Um, here we're taking M to be in here, and I should really take it to be something in M with divided by a power of F1, but you can easily eliminate that, and it's enough to do it just for M. Um, then on, um, let's look at DF2. Let's draw a picture just to focus our attention. So here's DF2. So on df2, it has image naught on df2 intersection df1. So that's this bit here. Well, it's obviously it's zero here, so obviously um, it has image zero here. Well, now um, df1, sorry, df2 
is quasi-coherent, or rather F restricted to, to this is quasi-coherent, which means that if something vanishes on this open set, then um, this means that M um, times some power of F1 is naught on the whole of D F2. Um, so, um, so for each I, M times F I to the N I is equal to naught on D F I for some N I. Um, and now we choose N large enough we find m times f i to the n equal, sorry, times, should be minus n, so that should be f1, um, is naught on all the d f i's. And this just means that m is naught in um, m f1 to minus 1 by definition. So that shows this map is injective. Um, next we want to show the map from m f1 to the minus 1 to f d f1 is surjective. So um, let's look at d f1 again and we've now got a d f2 and um, again, because F on D F2 is quasi-coherent, this means that anything, so um, if um, A is a section of F on D F1 intersection D F2, then A times F1 to the um, N can be extended to DF2 for some N. It's more or less the definition of, um, because if, if the sheaf is quasi-coherent on this, it means the values on here are just given by elements of here multiplied by some negative power of F. So um, we can multiply, so, so if M is in M, which you remember was F of X, then M to the F1 to the N1 can be extended to D F, sorry, that should be N2, to D F2. So in other words, by multiplying M by power of F, we can extend it to here. And similarly, by multiplying it by uh, another power of f, we can extend it to d f3. But now we run into a problem because um, we don't know whether these two extensions are the same on this area here. And the answer is, in general, no. Um, there's no reason why the extension to df2 should be the same as the extension to df3. So we seem to have a problem, but fortunately this is easy to fix. What we do is we notice that on this, let, let, let's magnify this little bit where we've got a problem. So we've got this space um, df2 intersection df3. And we've also got the intersection of them with df1, and the extensions are the same here. On, on, on the intersection with df1. Well, by applying the uniqueness result um, that we proved earlier to this open set here, we see that um, the extensions are the same on df1 intersection, so df2 intersection df3, if they're multiplied 
by some power of F1. Um, that, that's just saying that um, two things have this, if, if two things have the same um, image here, then they're the same on here if you multiply them by the power of F1. Um, so um, if we multiply M by a sufficiently large power of F, it can be extended to all the DFIs and the extensions are compatible. Um, so this just means if you unravel all this definite or or all these, um, this means that MF one to the minus one maps to DF one is surjective. and therefore an isomorphism. So this ends the somewhat technical proof that the two possible definitions of quasi-coherence are actually equivalent. Um, so um, what we'll be doing next lecture is giving some more examples and properties of quasi-coherent sheaves.